Bible to 1 Chronicles chapter 22. First Chronicles chapter 22. We're going to take a, one, a look at one verse to start with. That'll be verse 13. First Chronicles 22, 13. Let's all stand together in honor of God's word tonight. And we'll read verse 13. Then shall thou prosper if thou takest heed to fulfill the statutes and judgments which the Lord charged Moses with concerning Israel. Be strong and be of good courage. Dread not nor be dismayed. Since we only have one verse, let's go ahead and read that again. First uh, Chronicles 22:13. Then shalt thou prosper if thou takest heed to fulfill the statutes and judgments which the Lord charged Moses with concerning Israel. Be strong and be of good courage. Dread not, nor be dismayed. Our kind and gracious Heavenly Father, we do thank you for this opportunity to look at your word. We'd ask, Lord, that you'd speak to our hearts Give us exactly what we need to be better Christians and better examples for you. We thank you for your kindness to us. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Now I'm going to do something tonight I've only done one other time, and that's uh, use this thing here. Preacher keeps encouraging me. Use that, that uh, notepad there, and, and that's going to help you. And I agree with him because I have a whole basement full of shelves of messages and so forth and they're everywhere and once you go places you can't you're limited by how much weight you can take but you can download hundreds of messages on these things but I've only used it one time uh, when I was in in India and it was a different message than what I have with me tonight so uh, if if I'm if I mess up I'm going to blame it on this right now. I'm going to tell you, it's, it's the computer's fault, right? All right. Today I'd like to give you some information that's going to help you in your Christian life. But I'm going to tell you up front, I can't do for you uh, what I'm going to tell you tonight. You have to do it for you. I can't live for you, but I do want to help you, uh, as, not just as a preacher, but I want to be your friend and talk to you tonight that way as well. Here in 1 Chronicles 22, 13, in the story, David's an old man. King David's an old man. And he's talking to his son Solomon, who's getting ready to take over the kingdom. Now David wants the best for his son. How many of you have children in here? Okay, most of you do. You, you want the best for your kids. But you know, sometimes your children don't listen and they get themselves into trouble. And God does the same thing with us. He, he wants the best for us. Now, He's given us some instruction here, but if we don't listen to what He has to say, we're going to get ourselves in trouble. Now, what does He tell them? He tells them here in verse 13, He says, I'm going to charge you the same thing that was charged to Moses. He says, Be strong, be of good courage, dread not, nor be dismayed. So he tells them, you're going to have to be strong. Now he's not just talking about uh, physical strength. That's, that's great if you have it, but it's more than that. I heard a pastor say one time, the Bible says that we are fearfully and wonderfully made. If your body's working good, it's wonderful. But if it's not working so good, it's a fearful thing. So he's not just talking about physical strength right here. He's talking about mental strength with the mind of Christ, spiritually with the power of the Holy Ghost. Last night in our Grove City uh, Bible class, we talked about uh, your life should be with demonstration and power of the Holy Ghost. You need to be strong. Then, good courage. Facing the unknown or areas that were problems in the past, yet still going forward. Paul said that he pressed towards the mark for the prize of the high calling of God, which is in Christ Jesus. 
He pressed forward. You can't dwell on things of the past. First of all, you can't change the past, whether you dwell on them or not. But the devil knows that guilt is a strong taskmaster. And so if you dwell on the past, you're going to weigh yourself down. And that's going to rob you of the courage that you need to go forward. Dread. He says, dread not. Worrying about things to come. Now, we know the future generally because God's given us the Word of God. If, it's a, if there's a God at all, He certainly knows the future. That's why our Lord Jesus, uh, God, is the only God. Amen? Buddha didn't know the future, just to wake you up a little bit. Muhammad didn't know the future. He didn't give any prophecies in the Quran. Joseph Smith, he didn't know the future. Anything that he got, he stole from the King James Bible. Dread not. Don't worry about things to come. Dismayed. What's dismayed? Getting discouraged or a loss of courage after something bad has taken place. Bad things happen to all of us. Things catch us blindside. We weren't expecting it. And the devil wants us to just uh, let our sails fall apart and, and not go forward. And that happens from time to time. But God says, do not be dismayed. Now, how is this important to us? I want you to listen, please. God told Moses, the greatest leader the world has ever known, he told him in Deuteronomy, he said, Moses, you need courage. Moses told this to Joshua, probably Israel's greatest warrior, you need courage. So think about this with me. God tells Moses, the greatest leader, uh, two to three million at least that come out of Egypt and that he leads uh, through the Red Sea and in the wilderness. And he, God tells him, you need courage. But they fought very few battles. But Joshua, he becomes the leader and Moses instructs him in Joshua chapter 1 telling him over and over again, be of good courage. He's talking to the greatest warrior that we read about in the Bible, a picture of Jesus Christ himself, and says, you need courage. And God told David these things in the Psalms on a continual basis. Now David was the earth's greatest king. You have to understand that at the time that David was king in Israel, he was king over the known world. And God told him, you need courage. Now David tells Solomon here, who will be the wisest man ever, you need courage. So if God tells Moses he needs courage, and Moses tells Joshua that he needs courage, and God tells David that he needs courage, and David tells Solomon that he needs courage, God has written all this down for me so that I may have victory in my Christian life. Is it possible? Again, is it just possible that I am trusting in my flesh and in myself more than I'm willing to admit? So what is God telling me? You need courage. Let's look at uh, chapter 22, verse 18, and we'll read through to 19a. Is not the Lord your God with you? And have, hath, not, ha, hath he not given you rest on every side? For he hath given the inhabitants of the land into mine hand, and the land is subdued before the Lord and before his people. Now set your heart and your soul to seek the Lord your God. He tells him here, a God's going to be with you. He says in verse 18, the first part, Is not the Lord 
your God with you. How many of you are saved? Raise your hand. Amen. Pretty sure you're going to heaven. God said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. You say, Brother Yoder, I don't feel like it. I've had a terrible week. Well, that doesn't change it. The Lord's still with you. But now let's look at this in just a little bit more detail. As far as the world's concerned, are you or are, are we as Christians in leadership position? Does the world look at us and say, yes, the Christians are leading the world? No. Then practically, in the instance of Moses, Moses, remember now, the greatest leader in history of all mankind. We just looked at that. Does that apply to me on a practical level? No, it does not. As far as the world's concerned, are we in a position of a king? Is there anyone in here that's a king over the known world right now? No. Then practically, in this instance, uh, does the person of David apply to me? No, it does not. Not in this instance. Remember now, uh, Matthew 4, 4, A man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. But doctrinally and practically, there's some things that do not apply to me specifically. So, uh, the Christians are not the leader of the world right now, amen? Uh, we are not in a kingship position right now. So, uh, the areas of David do not apply to us. The areas of Moses do not apply to us. As far as the world is concerned, are we in competition with them as far as wisdom is concerned? No. As far as the world's concerned, we're not in competition with them. So in this instance, the person that's the wisest in, in, in everything, Solomon, does not apply to me practically. As far as the world's concerned, are we at war? Yes. The world, the flesh, and the devil, amen, those are our di three direct enemies. So in this instance, the person of Joshua does apply to us. He is the first man in the Bible that was guided by a book. So if we're going to get victory in our Christian lives, we, like Joshua, must have courage, and we're going to get it through this book. Now Webster's definition in the 1828 edition says, Courage, bravery, intrepidity, that quality of mind which enables men to encounter danger and difficulties with firmness, without fear or depression of spirits, valor, boldness, resolution. It is a constitute part of fortitude, but fortitude implies patience to bear continual suffering. Woo. Oh boy, Brother Yoder, what's that mean? Okay. He says a couple of things here. We, we know what it is to be brave. We, we tell that to our children. You just stay close to me, I'll take care of you. Because you want to be the big dad, the brave one. We know what that is. It's, it's a quality of mind which enables men to encounter danger and difficulties with firmness. So we find out that courage has to do with the mind. But then he says here it's a constitute part of fortitude. We don't say fortitude today. We say guts. Who's got guts? That implies that you are going to bear up under continual suffering. If you're the kind of person every time you're tempted with sin, you fail or you fall, it's because you do not have courage. You're not brave in your Christian life. You're afraid of the outcome if you don't choose sin. And you're being deceived by the devil. 
In other words, courage is something that God gives us through the decisions we make in our mind of our voluntary will. All right, let's, let's take it over here for just a minute. Uh, what, what is salvation? For by grace are you saved through faith. All right? So you're saved by grace through faith. Faith, forsaking all I trust Him. Grace, God's riches at Christ's expense. Now we know that God saves us through His grace. We're saved by God's grace from the faith that's given to us from Him. But it's twofold. It's God's ability, that's God's grace. Faith is man's responsibility. So as God reaches down to us in grace, it's man's responsibility to grab hold to God so that he can be saved. And so we're saved uh, by faith through God's grace as a free gift. Courage is twofold as well. God says, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. I'm going to take care of you. If the worst thing you can think of happens, you get to end up in heaven. But the other part is the decision of your mind. And I want to tell you, if you lack courage, you will not live the victorious Christian life. Because God isn't going to choose for you. You're going to choose for you. So the question then is, how do I get courage? You get courage the same way that Joshua got guidance from the book. Now, I'm not going to keep you long. We're just going to look at just a few scriptures here, and then we're going to go. Number one, you get courage by reading the book. Turn to Deuteronomy chapter 31. Deuteronomy chapter 31, here was Moses giving instruction to Joshua as he's getting ready to take over. And we read in Deuteronomy 31 verse 11, When all Israel is come to appear before the Lord thy God in the place which he shall choose, thou shalt read this law before all Israel in their hearing. So God told Joshua, if you're going to be the victorious uh, uh, general of the army of Israel, I want you to read the Scripture to them. We need to read the Scripture. We need to read God's Word. Why? Because it gives uh, courage in our lives. Please turn to Isaiah chapter 34. Isaiah chapter 34. Isaiah chapter 34, verse 16a. Seek ye out the book of the Lord and read. Seek ye out the book of the Lord and read. Many years ago, I wrote a fellow that was in prison, and he told me he was having trouble with his wife, obviously being separated like that for uh, quite some time on end. He, he was uh, in, in a bad way, and his mind was running here and there with everything. And I wrote him a letter, and I included this verse in there. And uh, months later, when he got out of prison, he said, uh, Brother Yoder, I remember that verse, and you're the only one that cared for me. Now, the part about being the only one that cared for him, that isn't true. But as he read this over and over again, he began to get courage in his mind, thinking, God will take care of me. The reason that you don't think God will take care of you throughout the day is because you don't read His Word like you should. It's a sad state when we cry all about our teenagers and young people, but if you ask them, where is your Bible, they don't even know. It's in the car, it's in the garage, it's in the van. I left it at church. Who knows where it is? No wonder they're weak in their Christian life. They have no courage. And so they say, I can't wait 
Because if I wait, something's going to happen to me. And they lack courage and they fall to sin. Let's turn to Isaiah chapter 61. So if we need to get courage in our life, number one, we need to read the book. But number two, we need to speak the book. Isaiah 61, verse 1, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He hath sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison of them that are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all that mourn. Now, this is a twofold prophecy here. I don't have time to explain all of it. But here you have the prophecy concerning the coming Messiah that would preach to Israel. And Jesus actually did that at His first coming. He went into the synagogue and He preached to His own people. He came unto His own and His own received Him not. But you see, the thing is, uh, we need to be like Jesus and proclaim and preach and talk of the book. You know, we can go to work. We can talk to all our buddies there. We can talk about, you know, the Final Four and basketball. And we can talk about who uh, traded this and, and that at the, at the NFL drafts. And we can talk about the Buckeyes all afternoon long. And we can talk about now's the best time to plant seeds and we want to uh, get them under the sun and, and water them so much so that we have lots of vegetables for this year. And we can just talk about anything, but it's just so difficult for us to talk about the things of the Lord. Again, some of us don't talk about things of the Lord because when we talk about things of the Lord, everybody knows we don't know what we're talking about. So we have to read the book, get the information, but then talk about it. I heard somebody yesterday. Who was that? Somebody in the Grove Studio. I think it was Mrs. Uh, Mrs. Procate. Was that you? Was telling me about memorization. Memorization is a very difficult thing for many of us. But you'll find out if you read something in the Bible and then you begin to ask questions about it and you begin to repeat it, that stays in your mind a lot longer. And so if we would read something in the morning in our Bible and then talk about it during the day to our, to our wife or to our husband or to a person that we work with or those of you that are retired, talk to that person at White Castle. <laughs> but I'm serious now. If we talk about that, it will be in our mind and give us courage. Turn to Matthew chapter 11. Matthew chapter 11, verse 1. And it came to pass when Jesus had made an end of commanding his twelve disciples, he departed thence to teach and to preach in their cities. So Jesus spent time alone with God, then he talked to his twelve disciples about what they needed, and then he would go out into the cities and tell them. Our responsibility is no less. We need to talk and speak the things of this book. And that's how you get courage in your life. Please turn to Joshua chapter 1. Joshua chapter 1. And let's read verse 8. Joshua chapter 1, verse 8. This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, and thou, sh 
that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein, for then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. Now, oftentimes we, con we concentrate on the success part because that's what we want. But we're not going to get the success part without, ha without having the courage that we need in our Christian life. And the third way that we get courage is by meditating on the book. There has to be time in our life when we step aside uh, from the busyness of our day, the busyness of the obligations that we have, and think um, upon the Lord, and we do that by thinking on His Word. The only way we know anything about Jesus Christ is by what it tells us in the Bible. It's very, very important that we know our Savior. Well, most people, the only thing they know about Jesus is they know the person that died on the cross. He's like a little thin sissy, and there's a couple little drops coming out of his hands hanging on the cross. And when they think of Jesus, that's what they think of. Because they don't think of the Jesus of the Bible. Many, many descriptions of Jesus throughout the Bible. The book of Isaiah is just loaded with pictures of Jesus Christ himself. Uh, he's, he, he's, a, he's a rough man. He's a warrior. He's a captain. He's God Almighty. He's the Father. He's the Son. He's, he's the, the, the one in charge of all things. Over and over again, descriptions of our Savior and Lord Jesus Christ in the Bible, and that's what we need to think on. Let's, let's go to Philippians. Philippians chapter 4. Many of you know this verse. Philippians chapter 4. Let's begin with verse 6. Be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, Whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue and if there be any praise, think on these things, those things which ye have both learned and received and heard and seen in me, do, and the God of peace shall be with you. Now as we look at this section, we see that verse 8, every single one of those attributes in verse 8, is an attribute of Jesus Christ himself, and it's also an attribute of the Bible. So when God says, okay, when it all boils down, uh, as they say today, what's the bottom line? Finally, I want you to think about these things. Because that's what's going to bring you the courage in your life to get victory. Now, you've, you've got to understand that God has left us here for a purpose. He, he didn't save you and tell you, I'm going to give you eternal life. Now, <laughs> now's my big opportunity. I'm going to see how much you can take. No, that's not what he's doing. He, he, he gets excited because you got saved, and he's thinking, now I have another person that, it's good, that is going to show the example of Jesus Christ. And that's what he wants for you. And that's why you need to get spiritual victory in your life. Why? So that you can be the example that Christ wants you to be. And you're not going to be that example if you do not have courage. So number one, read the book. Number two, speak the book. Number three, meditate on the book. Let's look at Psalms chapter 1. 
Again, many of you know these verses. Psalms chapter 1. Psalms chapter 1, verse 2. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. Then what? And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water. You're not going to be like a tree planted by the rivers of water if you didn't do any meditation. Again, we think God is just going to uh, magically give us victory in our Christian life. He's not going to magically give you anything. What you're doing is you're deceiving yourself, but God has given you exactly what you need to get victory. So if I don't get victory, whose fault is it? <laughs> it's our own fault. It's our own fault. Why? Because we didn't have the courage that we needed because we did not read the book, we didn't speak about the book, and we didn't meditate on the book. So when the waves of life, when the rushing waters of life came by, we were, we were washed away. Number four, do the book. Do the book. Turn to James chapter 1. James chapter 1, verse 22. James chapter 1, verse 22. But be ye doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. So yes, we can be listening to the book. Yes, we can be hearing the book. But that's not what brings us courage. What brings us courage is doing the book. Again, I, I work with all different types of Christians, and as I look out here, I have no idea what spiritual level you're on because your physical age does not reflect your spiritual maturity. Some people were saved when they were older. Some people were saved when they were little kids. Some people were saved when they were little kids. Now they're older, but they never did anything for the Lord, so they're still just a, a little baby in Christ. And we deceive ourselves that way. Brother Yoder, I've been coming to church for 30 years. Well, good. Where were you at soul winning? Now, again, I'm not picking on people, but we, we've, got an, we've got an obligation to be an example. We don't have very many young people in here tonight. So who are the young people looking to for spiritual counsel, spiritual example, and spiritual strength? They're looking at you. I've, I've literally, Bob, I've literally seen people crying from this church. <laughs> oh, we just don't have any young people in here. Why should they come here? Yes, we have a terrific pastor. And he loves people like I've never seen before. And he's a great preacher, a wonderful teacher. But there must be more to it than that. And the more to it than that is the people sitting in the pews. Some of you have already decided now, uh, when this revival comes here in a couple weeks, I'm not coming. I'm going to line something up so I don't have to come. I'm not tooting my own horn, but my wife and I, we have meetings and we're, we're planning how we can make it here. They, the, the, our young people want to see somebody that's fired up for the Lord and really honestly believes what they're talking about. Once you get to teenagers and, and young adults, they can th see through hypocrisy like that window right there. And, and that's the problem with our teenagers today, Why when they get to break loose, that they go the wrong direction because what we're saying never reached the heart. Because they saw all the examples that said, do as I say, not as I do. We have to do the book. When the Bible says, love your neighbor as yourself. 
I'm not going to ask for a show of hands, but how many people pray for their neighbors? We need to pray for our neighbors. How can we say we love them if we don't even pray for them? People in this church, there's people all over the room hurting. Did we, did we try to do anything for them? Bring them a pie, amen? amen. I, I, know, I know missionaries for 1040 International, they're just hurting like crazy, amen, Brother Xavier? <laughs> listen, listen we, have to, we have to do the book. And, and our problem here is, is not that we don't know the book. This church knows as much Bible as any uh, church that I've been in. It's incredible. A preacher, he'll start in on a verse and you finish it for him. Because you know it. But we've got to do it. Number one, read the book. Number two, speak the book. Number three, meditate on the book. And then number four, do the book. Everybody makes mistakes and everybody fails, but do not use that as an excuse for your lack of courage. Men... Act like Christian men. Talk like gentlemen. Be the leader God wants you to be. Get the sin out of your life. Sir, you need courage. Women, act like godly women. The Bible says you're to have the law of kindness in your mouth. Be a help, not a hinderer, in your home and in your church. Ma'am, you need courage. Young people, it's time to grow up and stop acting like infants. We see the babies in the nursery, and that's what we expect from them because they're babies. Some people need to grow up. They need courage. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for being so kind to us. Lord, we have messed up. We have fallen. We've done things that... Uh, over the years that just seemed to have piled up, and yet you said, I forgive you. But Lord, some of those mistakes could be avoided very easily if we had more courage. So I pray tonight that those that uh, desperately need courage in their life would come forward and ask you to give them courage, and then, of their own willful decisions, they would do those four steps that we've preached about tonight. With our heads bowed and eyes closed, how many would say, Brother Yoder, I'm really not sure that I'm saved. I hear people talking about that, and I want to go to heaven, but I'm not sure I'm going. Would you please pray for me? If that's you, would you raise your hand so I can pray for you? All right, thank you. How many would say, Brother Yoder, there's something in, you, in your message that you preach tonight concerning courage, and I'd like you to pray for me. Would you raise your hand? Amen, amen. Hands all over the building. Heavenly Father, you see the hands, but more than that, you see the hearts. Lord, we need courage, just as you instructed uh, these men of the Bible, we need courage today. Help us to do these things and bring you honor and glory in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you'd stand in the building, we'll play just an invitation song or two and we'll be finished. But if God spoke to you, please come to the altar and do business with him tonight. Just one more verse.
All right, look this way. Let me just make one comment, and then I'm finished. When I was over in India, I, I preached this message uh, very similarly through translation. And when I got done, the Indian pastor that was there came up to me weeping and said, Brother Yoder, this is the exact message that I have been praying for for months that you would preach to my people. I'm just asking you tonight, how did you receive the message? All right, the windows of heaven are open. The windows of heaven are open. The blessings are falling tonight. There's joy, joy, joy in my heart since Jesus made everything right. I gave him my old tattered garment. He gave me a robe of pure white. I'm feasting on manna from heaven. And that's why I'm happy. And that's why you're happy. And that's why we're happy tonight. Amen. You're dismissed.